Welcome everyone. This is the last of our program on African Jewish communities. Um, and today we are going to be looking at the community of the Abayudaya in Uganda and also in Kenya and um, gradually expanding, I think, through the continent. We have Rabbi Gershom Sizomo with us. I will, we will introduce him later. But I'd like to start today, not with a video, but with some music. I think this is a piece you might recognize the words to, although I would be surprised, interested, if the, I think the music will not be as you would have recognized, of course, Adon Alain. <laughs> I think I finally got it stopped at that. Adon Alain, but composed, the music composed by our guest today, Rabbi Geshwan Sizomo. He's the rabbi and the spiritual leader and Rosh Yeshiva of the Abayudaya congregation in Uganda. The first Jew from Sub-Saharan Africa to be ordained at a conventional rabbinic college. The story, I have to tell you, I was a rabbinic student myself when the uh, Rosh Beit Din, the Abbeit Din of the Reform community in the UK told us that he had had a request from Africa for an entire community to convert to Judaism. Uh, we got very excited about this, of course, um, but then the Rabbi Lionel Blue, who was the, um, the convener of the Beit Din at the time, basically said very sadly, he didn't have the resources to deal with this. And he wasn't quite sure how it could be done because there they were in the heart of the continent, a long way from the community. <laughs> Well, I think our loss was America's gain because the conservative movement um, took on the project and the whole community became Jewish. But uh, Rabbi Gershom will tell you the whole story uh, eventually. Um, he was the first one, though, to go to a rabbinic college, the conservative um, college, um, the Hebrew college, I think, in Boston, uh, and was ordained as a rabbi there. He had, uh, oh, sorry, the Ziegler School. It was the Ziegler School that he, he went to. He attained a BA from the Islamic University in Uganda. Um, and indeed, though, he's the first Jew to be the ordained um, and the, basically the only rabbi in the continent. Um, although I think there's about to be another one or just another one. 
um, Rabbi Gershon has uh, five children, Igal, Daphna, Nava, Siva, and Nadav. And he's also a musician who plays guitar and composes a lot of the liturgical music that the community uses, just like the one I played for you now, very African. Um, I wish we could use some music like this in our communities. I think it would liven it up enormously. But as always, I'm going to turn to uh, Malka, Dr. Malka Shabtai, who will introduce our guest and interview him. So oh, good evening, everyone. As I always say, welcome back and welcome to those who join us. Uh, I began the series with presenting the different categories of diverse Jewish communities in Africa. This evening, we are going to meet what we called the old and newcomers to Judaism. These are not one of the communities we mentioned so far with ancient origin of the, the tribes of Israel or the 10 lost tribes or so and so. Uh, through the many years, we have communities that choose to join uh, uh, Judaism through different people and ways. And this story of the Abayudaya is the most unique uh, uh, story of a community that last year celebrated 100 years since they became a Jewish community. We'll get back to it. So let us begin. Uh, Rabbi Gershom Sizamo, good evening. Please tell us who are these Abayudaya communities and how it all began. Uh, thank you, Malka, and everybody for inviting me to speak this evening. It is evening here in Uganda. It is already 8 p.m. I am the spiritual leader of Abayudaya, as already introduced, uh, a community of native Ugandans uh, who practiced Judaism since 1919, when the founder, from reading the Bible, discovered the five books of Moses and the Torah, from which he extracted Jewish beliefs of observance of Kashrut, of Brit Mira, of Shabbat and Hagim, and all that is written in the Torah. You know, the Torah forms the basis of Judaism. In this uh, part of, of, of the world, the Torah was the main source of Judaism. Without any rabbinic tradition, a gentleman called Semeika Kunguru, after reading about the story of Abraham Avinu, decided to circumcise himself and his children and his servants and to declare himself a Jew. And the word Abba Yudaya is Luganda for Yuda, Yudaya, Yudaya the people of Yuda, meaning the Jewish people. Actually, it doesn't only refer to our community, but it refers to you, Malka, as well. The Baganda will call you Abba Yudaya everywhere. Abba Yudaya in Israel, Abba Yudaya in the US, in the UK, everywhere. Abba Yudaya does not refer to us as a community, but it refers to the Jewish people. So that's how the community started in 1919 and uh, purely on uh, biblical Judaism, including sacrifices during Pesach because uh, uh, the Seder is not written anywhere in the Torah. So without a, a rabbinic tradition, they were bound to observe the Kurban Pesach uh, as a, a, a unique practice for the evening of Pesach or the, the, the 14th of Nisan. Uh, they also observed some rituals of the temple, including uh, rules of Tuma, uh, Tame. So if you, if you, for instance, if you touched a dead body or you got involved in any funeral service, you became uh, ritually anikirin, just like the priests uh, were during the time of the temple. And so people who got in touch with all kinds of uh, spiritual impurities, including women who go 
uh, for Nida in Nida were not allowed to enter into the synagogue. So those were the unique practices of the Torah that they extracted directly from the Torah. And it only changed in 1962 when the Israeli embassy opened in Kampala. And there was a relationship between the um, embassy staff that used to come for celebrations in Imbale. And the, the embassy did greatly, did a wonderful job of connecting our community to rabbinic Judaism, to rabbis in Israel, in the UK, and also in the US. And uh, through this connection, the community wait, wait, received wait. books. <laughs> Don't go further. Wait a minute. Just wait there. How many Abayudayas in Uganda today? Uh, currently, we have uh, almost 2,000 people. 2,000 people. How many synagogues are active now? Sorry? How many synagogues, schools? What is the community life? Uh, we have about eight villages and eight synagogues, uh, including the one in Kenya. And uh, we also have uh, a high school and a, a primary school. The, the primary school is called Hadassah. Uh, the high school is Semeika Kunguru, named after the founder, the founding father of the community. Uh, we also have a clinic called Tobin. Uh, to help our people with health challenges, especially malaria. Wow. So how your community make its journey to become part of the world conservative movement? How, how this is all happened? Uh, it, it happened uh, when uh, some visitors from the US, people from the US came to visit. And the one of our requests was that we needed to be uh, recognized by any rabbinic body, whether reform, conservative, orthodox, we didn't mind. And uh, based on our practices that were very closer to orthodox and also to conservative, uh, the, the visitors chose uh, a, a conservative bet dean which was uh, led by a rabbi from Maryland, Rabbi Howard Gorin. And he actually recruited the other rabbis in 2002. They, they flew over to Uganda and we had a conservative bet dean to formally take our community into uh, the Jewish ritual of Gerut. Or, or, or acceptance into, into, into Judaism, more conversion, you would call it conversion. Although members of our community did not call it conversion because we were already Jewish since 1919 and moreover proud Jews. So we didn't think that uh, any, any ceremony needed to be performed on us in order to make us Jews when we actually chose to be Jews in 1919. But as a rabbinic law requires, we had to go through the mikvah to do hatafat dambrit and to go through the interviews, uh, individual interviews by the Bet Din. Last year, you celebrated 100 years of being, uh, of, since you became a Jewish community. From, from this moment, when you look back at Kakangulu vision, do you think his vision has been fulfilled partially, fully? What happened to the idea that began 100 years ago to the point where you are today? Uh, Semeika Kunguru uh, had the dream of establishing a Jewish community in Uganda. And I think he would be very happy to hear me speak in his name and actually to mention his name, that whatever is here was started by him, although it changed. You know, the rabbinic story of uh, Rabbi Akiva and, uh, and, and, and Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu attends the yeshiva of Rabbi Akiva, and he doesn't know what they are talking about. Meaning by the time of Rabbi Akiva, Judaism had significantly changed from that of Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Avinu. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, actually, 
And uh, so, but the reference of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva referring to Moshe, this is a Torah uh, that was given by Moshe actually made him relieve. So we might have changed uh, more from what, whatever happened in 1919, but it is all in the name of the founder, Semei Kapunguru. You know, I have not visited yet Mbele, unfortunately, but from my friends that visited there, they talk about amazing, beautiful, special Jewish community. But as we all Thank know, you. but as we all know, you yourself and your community go through serious struggles and dialogues with the state of Israel, with the world Jewry. Please bring us into your present status, your present struggles where you want to go and what are the barriers on your journey yeah you know uh a, a, being a jew from africa and uganda is a, a surprise to many uh, uh, like uh, established jewish communities i have spoken in the u.s different congregations and people are actually amazed at the fact that uh, there could be a jew from the villages of uganda in Bali deep in Mbale, how could that be? So, so such questions uh, cause uh, sometimes they are good, but uh, many times uh, where our status is uh, concerned, uh, authorities in Israel think it is a joke. Uh, they think it is a setup, you know. It is a story that cannot be believed until you experience it, until you come to visit and see our communities. It cannot be just told to you and get it. You have to be with us. You have to see our daily lives, come into our houses, go into our synagogues and see how we actually live our Judaism as part of ourselves, not as a, something that is acquired. So because of that, I actually sympathize with the authorities in Israel that don't actually get it. I said they don't get it. They think we, 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 we are just set up. Maybe we are interested in migrating to Israel, forgetting that in 1919, there was no Israel to go to. There was no Israel in 1919 as a state. It was there as the land, uh, but uh, you know, there was no government of Israel. And uh, we uh, nevertheless have been around so we, our, our being Jew, Jewish is not premised on the need to migrate to Israel. We are Jewish because that is what we are. It is part of us. We have lived it. It's, it's like you, Malka. There's no way you can throw it away. You get it. So that is us too. But the authorities there have not gotten it. We pray that uh, and hope that in the future this will happen. Nevertheless, the Jewish agents uh, has uh, given us a formal recognition as one of the diaspora communities. And uh, we are only waiting for that time when the Misra Dapunim in Israel shall uh, eventually uh, find it necessary to recognize us. But the, I know we, we, we suffer the fact that we are from Africa which is a continent that has, uh, you know, whenever, whatever you talk about, uh, is uh, take, it's, uh, Africa is not taken serious, I will say so. If we are from somewhere else, maybe, <laughs> unfortunately. You are a leader. You are leading a large community and communities, and you are very active in, not only in Uganda as a parliament member, for those who don't know it yet, but also you are going on lecture tours in the US and around the world, and you uh, once in a while coming to Israel, even to visit me. What is your agenda for the next coming years? What is your agenda? What, are your, what is your vision? And how do you wish to proceed with your struggle for bigger recognition from the state of Israel and the rest of the Jewish world? Uh, thank you. My, my immediate mission is Le Dol Vador. Le Dol Vador is the song we sing every time on Shabbat. Le Dol Vador, 
ledol vadol nagid god lecha ledol vadol so uh, from one generation to the and another generation i'm uh, uh i'm i'm third generation of the people who started in 1919 my children got married, so I, uh, I'm actually supposed to see two, three generations uh, after me. So my immediate dream and vision is, is to pass on Judaism to the next generations and to ensure that those generations pass on. A recognition of Israel shall come when it comes. We shall continue to exist. We shall continue to press, and we shall continue to knock on the doors of Misra Daponim to know that we actually exist. But it is not in any way going to be our main mission. Our main mission is to continue from one generation to the next generation, so that uh, Judaism can be celebrated for another hundred years to come. If in another hundred years to come, Israel does not recognize us. We shall continue to exist for another hundred years, and we are happy to do that. <laughs> uh, my last question to you, and then open it to, to the audience, is uh, as mentioned before, you're a rabbi. You, are, you have the only yeshiva in Africa so far, and uh, I was privileged to send you one student from the community of the Beta Israel in Ethiopia to start learning with you. And there is a very uh, serious emergence of communities throughout Africa, whether they are old and ancient or newcomers to Judaism. What, how you are going to use your yeshiva as you already do? And further than that, do you have a plan of working throughout Africa with these communities that request learning and coming closer to Judaism, firstly in Africa, or you only focus mainly on your community and its relationship with the state of Israel and the rest of the world Jewry? Hey, thank you. Uh, you know, like Abraham Avinu, you know, Abraham had over 300 people who were not originally Jews, but uh, who he converted and became Jewish according to tradition and uh, according to Torah. So um, I still believe that uh, Judaism is an option and uh, Africans and other people have the right to choose that option. It is a spiritual option and a spiritual path that, is, uh, uh, that makes a lot of sense, that is logical and, uh, you know, I enjoy it and I believe uh, that other Africans could. So the purpose of the yeshiva was uh, to uh, help any African who wanted to deepen their uh, knowledge of Judaism to come and learn with me. I spent five years in a, a yeshiva in America and Israel. I definitely have a big library and knowledge to help Africans who are interested in Judaism to deepen their, uh, their, their knowledge of Judaism as they choose to live the Jewish way. And so um, I have had some Nigerians come to me actually. The one, my student, my Nigerian student who, 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 who is, ma is the one marrying the rabbi's daughter <laughs> from the United States. And he was he got converted in in Uganda. When he came, we took him to the mikvah, we, to the Bet Din, and he, he he's now becoming the leader of the Abuja community uh, of about to 61, 63, maybe sixty one to oh, sixty three members who are going to be converted, and we shall maintain our presence by teaching. It is quite challenging to have people come to Uganda because it requires financial, uh, like a, maybe financial aid, which is very difficult here in Africa. Many people in Africa live on subsistence farming. You cannot imagine, uh, you can't even in, uh, uh, um, expect them to pay a, an air ticket to come to Uganda and live in Uganda. So it is quite challenging financially but spiritually people have the spirit for Judaism. And uh, why not Why not have as many Africans uh, become Jewish 
since we have Muslims and Christians in Africa, neither of those religions started in Africa, but Judaism actually started here. The, the first Passover was in Africa. So Judaism and Africa are actually very connected. And I'm sure that many Africans could, do, uh, could do identify with the Judaism, which is a blessing. And uh, as far as I am, as long as I'm still alive, I will not hesitate to uh, help Africans who want to become Jewish come to Judaism and learn. Wow. Uh, let me uh, conclude uh, my, inter my short interview with you and just mention to the audience that uh, the uh, for the first time was a group from Abayudaya who came to Israel for Taglit. That was a breakthrough, exciting moment. And we are expecting the next time. Uh, uh, Cyril, you have the, the video, if you would like to show it in, by the end of the program, or would you like me to show it? That's a good way too. And I would like to pass it on for the audience to ask the uh, uh, questions. Just let me just mention uh, for your honor, uh, Rabbi Gershon Sizamo, that one of my students from the famous seminar, I keep mentioning here, that is writing, she's writing her seminar on the Abayudaya and the vision of Kakangulu. And uh, she might contact you later on, but she's with us in the audience. Natalie is here. So as you see, even through this seminar, we are connecting Israel, Uganda, UK, and the rest of the world. So let me pass it back for the audience to ask their questions. Thank you very much for the meantime. And Sibyl, if you would like me to show the uh, Taglit uh, uh, visit, let yeah. me know and I will prepare it. All right, thank you. If you would do that, that would be great. Um, uh, I know that Natalie um, wants to ask a question, but I'm going to hand over to Aviva, who is going to manage manage the questions. Indeed, the first person I'm bringing in is Natalie. So <laughs> that perfectly. Thank you, Malka, for handing that over so beautifully. Thank you. So over to you, Natalie. Hi. Uh, Rabbi Gershon, it's a great honor to, to meet you, to hear you. Uh, like uh, Dr. Malka said, I have just one, just one question now that uh, I'm sure that everyone will, uh, will want to know. Um, are there uh, costumes that uh, Kakungulu used to do uh, beyond the mitzvot that, um, and they remind uh, costumes for today, for the whole community? Uh, I, I, I didn't get um, some, somehow there was echo in your microphone, so I, I, I didn't get the question clearly. Could you, could you uh, yes. pardon me, please? Thank you. If there are, there are costumes that Kokongulu uh, used to do beyond the mitzvot, and uh, the remains, uh, the remand is the costumes for today for the whole community. Oh, some of the customs, okay. Uh, actually, uh, most of uh, what Kapunguru uh, did was to detach himself completely from his Uganda tradition. In order to become Jewish, he completely detached himself from the tradition of the Baganda. And uh, whatever he did as a tradition was directly from the Torah. I, there is an example of removing shoes before entry into the synagogue. And that was not commanded anywhere, but he adapted it from the burning bush. Uh, when Moses was instructed to take off his shoes because the ground he was standing on was a holy ground. To him, the synagogue was a holy ground. So the first Jews adopted that custom, and it only changed the recently. But it has it it is a custom that has been there for over eighty years. It changed in the last twenty years uh, because of our connection with Jewish communities in Israel and the U.S and us seeing that they, everybody goes to the synagogue with the shoes. 
So this is what he had also adapted from the burning bush. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie. I'm going to bring in Angie next, who has a question for Gershom. So let me just find Angie and over to you. Hello, um, thank you very much for this because it's absolutely fascinating. You've talked about links with America and your relationships with Israel, but you've got a, a, a large Jewish community just down the road in South Africa. How, have there been any relations with them and what sort of response have you got? Or are they being standoffish? Uh, actually, we have had some South African Jews come to visit. I myself has visited uh, Johannesburg a number of times. At one time, I was uh, uh, I went to teach at a con the only conservative synagogue in Johannesburg uh, that had lost their rabbi. So that was, the rabbi passed on, Zhronoli Vracha. And so I went there to teach for a weekend. I also have been to the black community in Africa called the Lemba, who believe that they are part of the Kohanim. Uh, they, for them, they don't want anything to do with rabbinic Judaism. They want to maintain their traditions as they are without any influence from rabbinic Judaism. I have been there too. Uh, I also have visited a, a rabbi in South Africa, I forget his name, who actually uh, is also interested. He is an Orthodox rabbi, but he's interested in finding out Jewish communities, not Black Jewish communities, but Jewish communities in Africa, like the one in the Nairobi. We have a, a, a Jewish uh, a, a community in Nairobi of expatriates who, who have a synagogue and uh, other places. And so he was much interested in that. I met him as well, but uh, other than that, we have not had any deeper relationship with the Jewish community of South Africa. That's quite sad, isn't it? Because it's, it's your nearest community. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually we need, we need ritual uh, objects like uh, Havdala candles, Kiddush cups. We need the kosher wine and the matzah for Pesach. <laughs> and the, the South African Jewish community would be very helpful. Mm. Mm. If you have any, any good links, we could probably could do, we could restart. I, I don't have South African links. It, it just interests me that they were there and they should be being helpful, but I suspected they weren't. <laughs> True. Thank you very much, Andrea. And for the next question, we have Roz, Roz Clayton. Um, yes, um, good afternoon, good evening, Rabbi. I, I found your talk so interesting, how, how you got so much information into about half an hour, I do not understand. Um, and it's opened up a whole new world. But what I really wanted to ask you about, I loved the music at the beginning, the wonderful harmonies. And I wondered if you've set other parts of the liturgy to music, and if it's accessible, is the music available or recordings available? Because I would love to hear so much more. It actually puts me in mind of some Christian liturgical music. I think there's one called a Baluba Mass, which is very, very beautiful. And it has these lovely, lovely African, what I call African harmonies. Um, but I found just that short snippet we had at the beginning so lovely. And I'd like to hear more, please. Yeah, our music is available. Actually, for your information, one of our albums was nominated for the Grammys in the US in 2005, while I was in rabbinic school. And I was honored, together with my wife, to go to the Grammys, although we lost to Paul Simon. Our album was uh, uh, up for 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 for, nom uh, for 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 the Grammys, we 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 thought it was wonderful. So our uh, the best way to find our music is probably to go online, not YouTube. <laughs> it will give you links 
uh, people, uh, we have uh, ethnomusician, musicologists who have recorded our music, and I think put either on some of the music setting websites. And all you need is to say music from the Jewish people of Uganda. You can look up that one and you might get links to some good music. If it is sold, I know it is uh, every song is in a sense. You pay some cents <laughs> to the website and you download uh, on your computer, which can be actually accessible. You, I've, I've written that down and I don't know how we've missed all this beautiful music, um, but it's absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So before we go on to the next question, I'm going to come in on that because when we were talking earlier before the session started, Gershom, you said you couldn't accompany yourself because you had to hold your phone in your hand, but you might be willing to sing a little bit a cappella for us. So yes. Something you might <laughs> my advice is Le Chadodin. That's my favourite one. Oh, okay. You want us? You want us to try the lejado de acapera? Mm. Okay. Ready? Lejado de licracalan penesha bat ne cabela shamor vezahol bedibure had ishmianu el hamiu had. Adonai echad, ushmo echad, leshemu lit feret, lit chilam, lechado di likrat kalam, pene shabbat ne kabela, yamin usimol tifirotsi, va eta adonai ta aritsi, aliyad ish ben parsi. Veni simcha venagilam lechado di likrat kalam pene shabbat ne kabelam boi be shalom ateret balam gam be simcha uvi sohoram toch emne am segulam. Boi chala, boi chala, lechado di likrat kalam, penei shabbat ne kabelam. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. And I'm going to bring in, before I go back to Malcolm Sabrina video, I'm going to bring in Angela for a last question. So one more question we'll get from the audience. Thank you. Tami Ramos Sisumo, it's wonderful to see you. Um, you won't remember, but I visited your community um, about two two years ago. And it was- Oh, um, yes, that's I think right. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was actually at that time that there were seven people who went, um, who went through the, the Beit Din then. And they, yes. uh, and I remember that time Wiener witnessed the men and, uh, uh, a wonderful young woman called Your 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 Neat, witnessing yes, yes, women yes. in the river. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And then, yes, exactly. and then, and that's when I heard you play the guitar for the first time because I jumped to my feet and we started singing and drumming. And you've got your guitar. <laughs> wonderful. Actually, <laughs> yes, it was a wonderful memory. It was very, very beautiful. Um, but that's not what I want to ask about. It was, it was really, if you could say something about the schools. You have a <clears throat> a, 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 a primary school, the Hadassah school, which receive some funding and also a high school which um i know is struggling very much with um from financial trouble can you say something about about what's happening with the schools there and also of course who goes to the schools because it's not just jewish children am i right yes yes exactly so as i said earlier we have two schools the hadassa is a, a, an All elementary right. school and then the high school and uh, Everything here is a, 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 a struggle, you know. Most the population we we have of, of subsistence farmers, they are not able to pay teachers. Yes. They are not able to pay for the running of the school. So we actually need help from outside of Uganda. 
to run and maintain these schools. They are very good because they are the only available good schools in the area that can teach not only the Jewish people, but even the Muslims and Christian neighbors, mm -hmm. because we teach all subjects, yeah. uh, including uh, the mathematics, science, and so mm -hmm. on, uh, besides Judaism and the Hebrew language to our children, and even to some Christians and Muslims who might be curious to know about uh, Judaism. Many of them uh, have actually learned uh, from our teachers and our students. So, but our schools are really uh, an important project for our community. It is where we pass Judaism to the next generation. It is where we train our people for Bar Misva. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, yeah, even those who want to be, who, who are interested in Judaism, Mm -hmm. get introduced to Judaism in our schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are very, very important. They're an important tool to maintain. Unfortunately, we are struggling. Thank you. Well, thank you. And if anyone in the audience has any thoughts or ideas to help, I know that, or money even to help, I know that would be appreciated. Thank you very, very much, Angela. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring in back both um, Sybil and Malka, because I know Sybil has a question and Malka has a video as well to maybe go with that. Um, so I'm going to bring you both into conversation with Gershom. What should we do first, Sybil? Well, I, I thought if I ask my question first and then we'll, we'll go on. To go the ahead. Is that okay? Yes. Because one, one area, and I must apologize, I failed to mention when I re read your, your bio, but um, when I read out your bio, was of course your work as a member of parliament, parliament. in Uganda. Um, you know, you're not only leader of your Jewish community, but you are a leader in, you know, in the nation. Um, and I'd be very interested to know, I know that you, you are using that very much to promote the, the work of the Jewish community. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Actually, uh, the, the reason I was elected to be a member of parliament was that uh, the projects that we have are not exclusively helping Jew, Jewish people. So the community around saw that uh, we uh, the, the 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 spirit of inclusiveness that uh, I introduced in, in the community was a, a big a good example for, to everybody. You know, we we also had the I talked about the health center, and in our clinic we have helped many people survive the death from malaria. You know, they bring in somebody, we have a microscope and a laboratory, we check their blood. If they have malaria, we treat them in 48 hours, they're out of danger. So we have saved lives. We have shared every little that we get from outside, be it food aid or anything, or mosquito nets, we have shared all these. And uh, I, I, my, my, my purpose of going to parliament was to continue promoting the interreligious relationship in my community. And uh, I was the best uh, suitable candidate for that kind of relationship. And I continue to promote that, uh, to promote uh, um, cordial relationship between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Thank you, thank you. So let me share with you uh, this uh, ultimate um, exciting video for the first time in history when we had a group from Africa, from the Abayudaya coming on Taglit to Israel and their reception in, is in, in the airport. I, I just want to remind you that there is a long way to still for struggles, but let's stay for few moments so let me do that I just say for people who might not know what taglit is it's what we call birthright ah okay okay uh, so let me do it this way since the end of the semester i forgot but let's go
preamp sound. Well, there's no sound. I think you need to take the optimize for sound before sharing. the sound again, Malka. Malka, can you can you optimize the sound again? It's just a brief, oh, Rega, it's just a, a brief taste. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so I say just a brief taste. I put the link uh, on the chat uh, to share with all of you. And uh, you can find it on, the, on uh, YouTube and many other videos of the journey uh, to the Kotel and so on and so on. Unfortunately, we only had one group from uh, Uganda so far. And uh, you know the gap between this kind of acceptance and the issues that are still uh, for struggle and justice are a long journey that uh, some of it we do together. <coughs> Most of it, uh, Gershom is leading his community and uh, together with friends and uh, many friends uh, around the world. So that was my share with uh, Rabbi Gershom Sizamo so far. Uh, Rabbi Gershom Sizamo, your final word or anything before we can uh, move to the closure of this session. Yes, every time I speak, I recruit friends of Abba Yudaya. Uh, Maruka, you already recruited a friend of Abba Yudaya, and I would like to take this opportunity to confer upon everybody who listened to our talk and who attended this evening to be an ambassador of Abba Yudaya to promote our community and to advocate for our community in Israel and elsewhere so that uh, we continue from strength to strength. I thank you for your attention and for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Gershon. It was lovely to meet you online like this, uh, to be inspired by you and to wish you um, all the very best of luck and success in the future for you and your communities. And indeed, I love the idea that we are all Abba Yudaya. Um, <laughs> we are all part of your community as well as you are part of ours. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And for our final comments for this uh, seminar, uh, would you like me to be first? Would you like you to be first? I'd, I'd like you to be first, if that's okay. okay. So I'll spend as less time as possible. So 
dear pa participants, for all of you that has been with us since the beginning or just uh, joined us occasionally to one session or another, I would like to say very brief uh, uh, summing up words from my point of view. As I introduced myself in the beginning, I dedicate my life for the last 10 years on behalf of diverse Jewish communities in Africa and Brazil mainly. There is much work to do ahead of us. In my uh, uh, very few sentences, I would like to emphasize these three aspects. First, this seminar is one effort, one courageous effort led by Sibyl to increase learning and encounter with communities and especially leaders of these diverse communities and think about the place that they should have and we should have together with them in our large Jewish family. The second thing I want to mention, and you will surely get a, 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 a civil document about ways to communicate, connect, and keep in touch and keep your interest with these diverse communities, mainly directly with the leaders or through me or civil as you wish. What our main goal is not only to help, we, not, we are not looking for donors. We are looking for members of the large Jewish family to practice peoplehood, to visit, to support, to communicate, to understand much better the diversity in, in our large uh, Jewish world. Whoever, uh, you know, where everyone can choose his own path, own way, or mode of Judaism. And finally, I would like to just say, I'm doing my best. There are many, many people around the world who are doing their best. We are very optimistic at this moment in history. We do have a new government in Israel. This gives us a lot of hopes. There are partners in this new government that are aware of this big issue of uh, diversity in Judaism. There is work to do, we are doing it. And besides of it, every person, where, whether you are in your own family, synagogue, community center, UK, US, or anywhere else, can spread the word that there is much more to know and learn and accept from other models of Judaism. And I believe that the ancient concept of Shivat Zion, calling all of us to work act actively at this moment of history to make the words of our prophets to come true. So I would like personally to thank Sibyl being so energetic, uh, uh, serious, and put this idea to work. I just said in the beginning that it took me 10 years to beg every Israeli university and college to let me teach Juda on Judaism in Africa. And this year, for the first time in history, I did that. And Sibyl came after with even a better version of inviting the leaders of the community and make this dream come true. But this is only the beginning. Thank you very much for being part of that. Thank you so much, Melka. And thank you very much for enabling this, uh, this series to, to actually happen. Um, I'd like to cast you, your minds back seven weeks. It seems such a long time since we started this, when we looked at the Bush report of diversity in Judaism in the UK. Um, and we had um, uh, Kevin came and, and uh, Kenneth came and spoke to us the, the following week. I don't know if Kenneth is here today. Oh, um, uh, no, he isn't, sadly, that's, um, but, but to, to, to really talk to us about the experience of being Black and Jewish in the UK. And um, the wonderful term that um, Stephen Bush had come up with in the report about the Ashkenazification of Judaism. Because the Ashkenazi community is the norm in this country, we kind of assume that this is what Judaism looks like. I grew up, as I'm sure many of you did, knowing that there were two Jewish communities. There were the Ashkenazim and there were the Sephardim, and that was it, full stop. 
it was only when I went to Israel that I discovered the Mizrahi community as something as being very specific and very different from the Sephardim. But even that is only half the story. When Jews left the land of Israel, they went south as much as they went north. Indeed, they went south first. There's no question in my mind that the communities in Africa are much older than ours. Many of them may not conform to rabbinic Judaism as it has developed in Europe, but Europe is not the center of the Jewish world. It's a concept that I find has turned my own thinking completely inside out. But I think that's a good thing. And I hope that what we've been able to do in this program is do the same for you, to realize that Judaism is just so much bigger and so much more diverse than the way we have been taught it in the past. And I hope you will join me in the future in trying to spread the word and correct the worldview that the majority of our compatriots have. Because certainly Judaism is big and much bigger than ours. If numerically we were to include all those communities that we have looked at to, um, so far, the, um, the uh, Beit Israel would number, how, Malka, how many Beit Israel are there? There's something That's like- 150,000. 150,000. I mean, that is, uh, you know, the community in the UK is only 250,000. So that would, you know, is a sizable number itself. If you add that to that, the Lemba, again, I can't remember the numbers, Malco, do you remember the Lemba? That's 150,000. Another 150,000. Zimbabwe. And then, you know, uh, that's just Zimbabwe and the Lemba are found in South Africa and um, Mozambique and many of the other countries around too. And then if you were to add the Nigerian community, that's something like 40 million, something 20 million, I think. I mean, you know, we, Judaism and Jewish tradition and Jewish heritage is something that is absolutely huge. So I do think we all need something of a rethink as to what, who we are, who is a Jew and what we stand for. And indeed the great ancient tradition of which we are part. I want to thank my partner in this Jewish Renaissance and Aviva in particular um, for helping us realize this vision. I'd like to thank Emma, who has been the technical person behind that. I don't know whether the two of you want to sort of show yourselves and, and say a few, few words. What I will say is that actually Kenneth is here. He Kenneth. is revealing himself. So should we briefly oh, bring Kenneth in yes, before? Please, let's bring Kenneth in. Okay, I will do that. He's unmuted. Oh. And Hello, Kenneth. Would you like to say? Oh, hi. Hi. Hi, uh, yes. How are you doing? Well, we're good. We're good. Lovely to see you there. Nice. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I'd like to, yes, I'd like to ask you, I'm going to, at the conclusion of this, of course, I'd like to remind you all again that all the videos are available. You have the links, I think, that they will be, the, the video for tonight will be sent out tomorrow, the link. We are also going to send out a, 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 a list of um, events which we're saying, where do we go from here? Um, Kenneth, I'd like to ask you particularly, as far as the community in this, in this country is concerned, where do we go yeah. from here? Um... The best bet is to, um, in terms of my work or the Jewish communities? Well, both. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, you can find my information on Facebook. Um, my full name's on um, on this um, uh, Zoom, Zoom account. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, also, as well, I'm trying to work on my Twitter and Instagram account at the moment. Um, so that I could actually um, do some forthcoming projects regarding Black British Jewry and also um, working very closely with African Jewish communities, um, especially projecting Kenya 
and also working in the project with the Nigerian Jewish community as well and future projects within North Africa. So yes, yes, definitely. Um, just to say thank you to Sybil, Malka, uh, Aviva, Emma, and all the people who uh, took part in this um, sessions. It's really, really educational to hear a lot of people, um, guests and hearing a lot of information going on. So yeah, it's, it's brilliant really. I think this is like the starting point to hear what the future forthcomes. There's so many Jewish communities to explore, not only in Africa, but in Asia, the Caribbean, South Africa. So yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's brilliant really. Thank you so much for providing these sessions for us and everyone within the UK, the US, Israel, Africa, where, wherever in the world. Well, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, Malka has said that for all the guests that we have had here would welcome personal connections with us. So we will be sending out um, for each community um, the actual links, the email and um, phone numbers of some of them for, you know, if you want to communicate by WhatsApp and they will welcome questions from you. If there were some that you know arose after the session or you weren't able to ask them in the session you will be able to do that there are a few books uh recommend to read a little bit more about the communities um, and we hope we see this very much as the start of something not the end of it although it is of course the end of this series i don't know whether aviva you'd like to talk a little bit about the programs your programs for the autumn um, okay, thank you. Well, just to add in terms of that, that there is a lot of material in the Jewish Renaissance archive about um, African Jewish communities, black Jewish lives, um, and all sorts of other. So for any of you who are subscribers, please do access our archive for further reading. Anyone who isn't a subscriber, together with your videos and the material, you'll get an offer for to anyone who is a non-subscriber who's attended this series of 40% off a subscription. So I hope you'll enjoy that. And just to flag up that we we will, we go different places every quarter. Um, currently the magazine is in Japan. Our Jews of Japan um, session is available to watch on our YouTube. Um, we are actually next quarter, we are staying in the UK, but after that we'll be traveling farther afield again. And we will absolutely make sure everyone on this project is connected to and linked up to that. And I do hope down the line in the not too distant future we'll be doing some writing um, and some other kind of features on different African Jewish and as um, Kenneth just said, Asian and Caribbean Jewish communities as well. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, and just to say to you all, thank you for being with us. You've been a tremendous audience and brought a lot to it. And this has been a really interesting dialogue and discussion um, for which I have learned a huge amount. Um, I'm hoping you have too. So massive thank you to Sybil and Malka. Sybil, final word to you. Oh my goodness, I feel I've said quite enough, but um, just to say the Lions Learning Project um, in conjunction with Jewish Renaissance is working at the moment on a programme for the autumn, which will be rather different from this, which is going to be on Jewish medical ethics. Um, so we hope that uh, you will enjoy that um, as well. So look forward to seeing you in the autumn. Have a good summer. Goodbye. <laughs>